Hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to the Debeki Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. I'm Sachin Goel, interventional cardiologist here at Houston Methodist Debeki Heart and Vascular Center, accompanied with my colleague Dr. Nadine Faza. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Samir Kaparia, who is going to be uh, giving this Grand Rounds uh, here in person today. Dr. Kaparia is the chairman of the Robert and Suzanne Tomsich Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, Seidel and Arnold Miller Heart and Vascular Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. He's a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Kaparia is a world-renowned authority in the field of structural heart interventions and has performed thousands of transcatheter procedures, including TAVRs, mitra clips, TMVRs, tricuspid interventions, uh, and is, is, is truly an uh, 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 expert in this field. It is our uh, distinct honor and privilege to have him here uh, present these grand rounds. Dr. Kaparia uh, uh, finished his medical uh, training in NHL Municipal uh, uh, College of Medicine in, in Gujarat, India. Uh, he did his residency training uh, right here in Houston at the Baylor College of Medicine, followed by a research fellowship. And then uh, he went to Cleveland for uh, fellowships in cardiology and interventional cardiology. Uh, he was faculty at uh, the VA system in, in Seattle for a few years before returning to the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, where he has been uh, a staff cardiologist since 2003. And he's now the chief of uh, cardiovascular medicine uh, at the same institution. It is also my personal uh, pleasure uh, for both Dr. Faza and myself, uh, as he has been our personal mentor mm -hmm. for so many years. Uh, so without any further ado, I uh, uh, pass on to Dr. Kaparia for his talk that uh -huh. we are so eagerly waiting to hear. Thank you very much again, you know, Sachin and uh, Nadine. You know, it's my great pleasure to be here in, uh, in uh, Houston. Uh, it reminds me of the memories of uh, my residency and uh, I'm really fond of the institution and also uh, the wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful support uh, from a lot of mentors including uh, Dr. Kleiman, Dr. Uh, uh, Reardon also and uh, many other uh, close colleagues and friends here. So I'm so proud uh, to see you all here and in the leadership role. So this is just amazing. With that in mind, I'm going to start my talk. Uh, what I was planning to do, of course, maybe focus on the tower, but also uh, focus a little bit on the mitral clip and a little bit on the tricuspid valve, just the areas that I am personally interested in and I think that are good. I brought a picture. Uh, so this is a picture uh, when I was here. So this is uh, in 1991. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Dr. Jim Young. Jim Young was uh, my heart failure attending. Uh, in uh, Houston. We both moved together in 95 as I as a fellow and he as a head of uh, transplant. And this is Dr. Doug Mann. This is Guillermo Torre, uh, myself, and uh, Rob McLellan now who is in Seattle as a, a chief of cardiology there. Uh, so this has been, uh, it has been a great pleasure and honor to work in, uh, in the Baylor College of Medicine also at Methodist Hospital because this is they combined together at that time and we were working together. So the outline of the talk is like this, that we will talk about the aortic valve therapies, we'll talk about the mitral valve therapies and a little bit of tricuspid. So procedural advances. So I just wanted to give a little bit of an insight of how we do it in Cleveland Clinic. So these are the patients who are referred for tower, they're high risk, intermediate or low risk, or patients who are interested in research because there are quite a few patients who come because they want to have something new. And the patients are seen by cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, uh, and cardiologists can be any, interventional cardiologists, imaging or clinical cardiologists interested in percutaneous therapies. And then all these patients are presented uh, every week. We have a conference uh, where we go over all the tower, all on Mondays and Fridays we do mitral and tricuspid, where we look at echoes, cath, everything together and then we have a combined decision to make and then we send out a report communication to patient to say that so and so was present and we all decided together that this is what we are going to do. I just want to highlight this one little, uh, uh, little slide to say that what are the considerations. Of course, the most important one is you are going to put biological valve, bioprosthetic valve or mechanical valve. If you are going to put bioprosthetic valve, then surgery or tower probably gives the same kind of uh, kind of uh, results uh, and then the anatomy is the most important so whether we are able to put a new valve in valve in the future so the lifetime management 
is super important. So that's why I put that little figure on the other side. We just published it with uh, Stefan Wendecker, myself, and other people in European Heart Journal to say that how do we, when do we send patients to surgery? So this was the topic that they asked us to write a paper. It's a very detailed paper. But the idea is this, that depending on the age, we have different options during the lifetime management and what are the considerations for these different options. So it is worth uh, you know, going over if you have time. I brought the picture of our tower team and uh, Sachin is there in the front. Uh, this is our uh, initial team for the tower. This is before the COVID time, so we used to all sit together. And uh, we used to have every, uh, I remember Monday morning, uh, that we used to get together and have a conference. Uh, this is Dr. Tuju, uh, this is Dr. Svensson, uh, myself, uh, Amar, Stephanie Mick, uh, Jose Navia. So this is a, a team that started uh, the tower and we were very proud uh, that Sachin was part of our team. Uh, we always discuss the anatomy and the surgical comorbidities also at times. This is the this is another important thing that we have been doing, that we create a slide for every patient. So this slide is created with our fellows and uh, attendings, and it has clinical features, labs, CAT data, echo data, because all these patients are very, very similar and run into each other when we are doing so many cases. And then we measure the CT scan, and the measurements are made according to whether it is a fellow, myself, or whoever measured it, and we write it down that who measured it. And this is part of the report. So it also becomes a pre-report uh, for the patients. This is our room, hybrid room. It's large, uh, but at the same time, very few people. So no swine gans, no general anesthesia, no art line, no Foley, none of this. So this is a very simple, straightforward procedure. We have also changed the way we do tower a little bit over the last four or five years. So I just want for technical details. So we get an access in the femoral artery like everybody else does, but we just use one per close. After we put one per close, we put an eight French sheath in that uh, top artery. Then what we do is we go just below. So if this is the artery, we would just stick just below it with a second needle. Uh, again, you know, you don't need anything, just put your fingers and stick below it. Uh, and get into the common femoral or even SFA doesn't matter. But about three, four centimeters below, uh, we would enter. And then this is how it looks. So this is a eight French sheet, this is a five French sheet, this is the venous sheet. And we also do uh, a sentinel device in all the patients. So that is the sentinel device. Uh, this is our setup, just to again to show that this is a monitor, This oh, we have a biplane lab, so these are the biplanes echo, transthoracic is available, and then we slave one little thing to the anesthesia also for MAC, uh, so they can record their things on their anesthesia instrument. We always do the sentinel device, and it is relatively fast, so we can get it done within three or four minutes, and we will have the protected tower data coming up uh, during the TCT this year. We have completed the study, and I'll show you just the, the basic information about the protected tower. So the another difference is that we are using a straight flush catheter rather than a pigtail catheter in the non-coronary sinus. Uh, this is also something different that we do. Just I'll, I'll show you why. We always measure the hemodynamics uh, in all the patients. And then when we deploy the valve, this is a balloon expandable valve or self-expanding. We are doing it in a cusp overlap method uh, in the RAO caudal view. But the idea is this that when we are putting the valve, we are trying to identify the radiolucent part of the S3 valve. And we put the radiolucent part, you see that here, the first link, and we put the link right at the bottom of the straight flush catheter. So the straight flush catheter is telling us where the non coronary sinus is. And then when we expand the valve, it shrinks or it uh, foreshortens exactly that much. And so it comes at the bottom of the line. If you look at the uh, classic view, uh, co-planner view, then it looks very high, right? Because usually people say that put this dot at the bottom. So this is very, very high. It doesn't embolize or anything. And I'll show you the data in a few seconds uh, of all these things that, because everything we do, I like to publish uh, with the fellows to say that we did the right thing or not. So at least we look at very critically and let other people look at it too. 
So after we deploy the valve, we just inject a little bit of, because we never removed the straight flush, so we inject a little bit of dye in the sinus to just show that how far up we have placed it. So we'd like to put it one millimeter or zero millimeters below the, uh, and it looks, in the LAO view, looks like that. Uh, as you see it here again, one more time. Uh, so right there. Uh, we assess the AR, transthoracic echo, uh, and again, we have done a couple of things that will decrease the aliasing velocity. So we normally will come down on the aliasing velocity to see if there is any AR. Uh, sometimes we can even inject a little few bubbles, not bubbles, but saline on the top if you don't want to give dye. Uh, but we always do a contrast injection. And then we check the hemodynamics. So in all the patients, we check the hemodynamics. And we have several different papers written that what are the different indices we use, the AR index, um, uh, TIAR index, we call it, which is independent of the heart rate. Uh, and we also look at the dichrotic notch. So if the dichrotic notch is above half of the downslope, then there is not much AR. So this is also helpful. Then one last thing we do is that now we remove the pacemaker from the uh, apex of the uh, right ventricle and then pull the, pull the pacemaker up into the RA and then pace it. So we go from 90, 100, 110, and 120 beats per minute. And at 120 beats per minute, if we can conduct one to one, so if we conduct 120 beats from the atrium to the ventricle, we say that this is not uh, having any kind of conduction abnormalities, and we can discharge the patient the same day. This is different uh, if we are going to find a conduction abnormality. It does not mean that this is something bad, because then we don't know whether the obstruction is at AH or HV interval many young people can block it in AH even as normally if you pace them fast enough. So this is something to keep in mind that if you can conduct one or one to one, we did not find any problem of needing a pacemaker. And we say less than 2% chance, but even those two patients that we published, uh, both had left bundle branch block. So we paced them uh, for synchronization rather than for AV block. Uh, then we do a completion angiogram. So again, simple because now we took the top sheath out. I brought a patient which has some stenosis there. Uh, but the idea is this, that we cinch the top. Uh, if it looks good with one per close, great. If not, we put one more angiosil. So that way we have less of a arterial cinch. And then in the bottom artery, we just inject a little bit of uh, dye to see how it looks. If it does not look good, like here, uh, we would just very quickly put a, uh, put a balloon from the bottom. So you can just put a balloon from the bottom uh, in the same sheath, balloon it, even stent it, uh, and uh, we can be done very, very fast. And then we just use manual pressure for the bottom sheath, give protamine, manual pressure, take out the venous sheath and the uh, arterial sheath. We have a short, small team of people that we work with in the sense that the nurses, tax, fellow, uh, and a cardiac surgeon is always there. So these are the, this is one case. Uh, but we have four different operators working together. So I'll just show in the next five minutes our data to say that this is the, these are the outcomes for comparing general anesthesia and monitored anesthesia. So in 2017 or so, we changed everything to, uh, or maybe 16, we changed everything to uh, monitored anesthesia. So nowadays, we hardly ever use, except for alternative access, uh, general anesthesia. And if you look at some people question this, that if you do general anesthesia and do TE, you can see better and you can identify the AR. But as I said, we do AR assessment in all three ways. Uh, and we looked at the long-term outcomes. There were no difference in long-term outcomes of these patients. Unilateral access, we found that it's very safe uh, compared to the bilateral access. So we did not find any groin problems, anything to worry about that. Single versus double per close, again, same. 66% of times we can just use single per close and uh, no, 30% of times single, otherwise we use angiosil and per close together. But again, no complications, more complications. And this is the high deployment. So with the high deployment, again, we found that, you know, so we went from 3.2 average to 1.5 millimeters. So very, very high deployment. And you can see that the pacemaker rate came down to 5.5% from 13%. So this is a huge difference. Uh, and even if the new onset left bundle branch block came down from 12 to 
to 5.3. So this is uh, again published. Uh, all this information is uh, published. And then this is the paper that I mentioned, uh, Dr. Amar Krishnaswamy, who is our uh, head of the cath lab. We wrote together and we even did the study at two centers, one here and one in Milan with Dr. Colombo uh, so, uh, and Azim. Uh, and what we see here is the data that I just told you that the risk of permanent pacemaker is very, very low if you can conduct fast enough. This is the data for same day discharge. So we started same day discharge just before the COVID time. Uh, and during the COVID, it was a great uh, asset to us because we didn't have to put the patients in the hospital. Uh, and these are the criteria that we use that if we have six hours of observation after the procedure, then we can discharge the patient. Again, we published this uh, and we ambulate the patient. So once we uh, go and check them out before discharge, ambulate them, if patients are comfortable, then we let them go. Next day discharge is again in another 63% of patients. So totally 85% uh, of our patients are discharged uh, within a day. Again, if you look at the same day discharge versus uh, non stain same, same day discharge, we did not find any differences in, uh, uh, in any of the outcomes. But also, very importantly, the most important predictor is that we have to have time before we discharge. So if you finish before noon, we can, we can discharge them by 6 o'clock uh, so that by the time we go home, we can discharge the patient. So that was the idea. Typical follow-up, we see all of the patients next day. So if you discharge them today, we will see them tomorrow in the clinic. We check their groin, we check, check get an EKG, uh, and uh, otherwise we say see them back in 30 days, six months, and one year. Uh, and if the gradients increase, mean gradient increase by 10, then we do a CTA. Otherwise, we don't do a CTA. Uh, and uh, if there is a no, you know, if there is thrombosis, uh, or halt or any other suspicion, then we consider NOAC or warfarin for six months to one year. So that duration is a little bit longer than most people use, but that's what we have been using. So these are the data from 2018 to 21. So we were doing 500 cases, then we went to 700. And you see that, that even during the COVID, we did not decrease our volume. 30 day mortality saw 2,500 patients. So large number of tower patients. 30 day mortality is 0.3%. Stroke is 0.5%. AR more than 2 plus is 0.4%. And new pacemaker rate is 2.7%. So you can imagine that with this data, it is acceptable to have an option of TAVR to low risk patients if they're interested. So we have to select the right patient. We have to select the right kind of uh, patients to do this. But this is an important part to keep in mind that you should track the data and look at very carefully that what are the outcomes uh, these are the main outcomes we look at, but also we have readmission, uh, renal failure, atrial fibrillation, all of those things that normally people report. So the change is real. So we have gone from, uh, you know, surgical side to considering the tower uh, for everybody. Now, I wanted to just highlight a few things that are relatively new. So one of the things, not new, but more data are necessary and people are working on it. So patient prosthesis mismatch. So if you look at this patient prosthesis mismatch, there is a there is lot of uh, literature that is coming out to say that how do we really measure the patient prosthesis mismatch in tower valves. So in the tower valves, as you know that there is a, there is a lot of uh, debate whether the hemodynamic measurement by the transcatheter measurements, invasive measurement versus echo measurements, which one is uh, accurate or what are the reasons why they are not exactly the same. Most important reason is the pressure recovery so that the kinetic energy is again converted back to the uh, get back to the pressure and you can measure it. So if the aorta is small uh, and uh, if you have uh, a laminar flow that sometimes this happens. So this is important to keep in mind and it depends on the type of the valve. Uh, so what how do we how do we see this? So this particular study, as you can see, uh, that if you are going to measure in the self-expanding valve or balloon expandable valves, and if you measure the invasive mean gradient or echo mean gradient, the invasive gradient is obviously less and echo gradient is higher. Uh, so how much is the difference? So this is, uh, this is to say that if you measure the invasive gradient close to the sinus versus you measure the invasive gradient in the ascending aorta, how much difference you make. So this is the equation. This is a reasonable equation, old equation, 1999. 
so here you can see this that if you take the let's say the me the gradient was about 20 uh, and if you if you take the aortic valve area to be 1.6 and aortic size 8 meaning you know not particularly dilated uh, 8 8 centimeter square and then if you just use the equation then you will come up that mean gradient is either 20 or 14 which makes a big difference in the in the management that if you have a mean gradient of 20 versus a mean gradient of 14 you would have a different kind of management uh, for these patients the definition of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch also in the this is the VARC 3 criteria so there is a addition to the BMI now placed in place so if your BMI is more than 30 so if you are or obese uh, then you can see that the severe has a little downgrade so instead of 0.65 centimeter square per meter square is 0.55 centimeter square per meter square for the severe moderate is also 10 points less so this is an important thing to keep in mind that when you review the literature how people defined it whether they took the BMI in consideration or not or how what were the exact cut points that people use because the literature is all over the place so the third part is in the literature there is a lot of information about the measured versus predicted so when we look at the most of the surgical data so far published they are all predicted meaning that if you have a valve uh, that was manufactured by the manufacturer and they said that the valve area would be 1.8 or 1.7 centimeter square then you divide that by the BSA of the patient and you say whether you will have a patient prosthesis mismatch or not for this size valve so this is how most of the literature is published for the surgical valve when the tower valve came in place since we are doing echoes and we have core labs and we are measuring it over and over people came up with the measurement of the aortic valve by measuring the LVOT size gradients and then say that this is the valve area and then divided by BSA so this was called the measured PPM now if you look at the measured versus uh, predicted PPM for SAVR and TAVR so this is for the SAVR valves and this is for the TAVR valves and this is from the partner uh, study uh, you can see it here that if you look at the measured uh, EOA it means this is this is the cut point that you can put meaning that this is the these are the people who you would say would have patient prosthesis mismatch these are the people not with patient prosthesis mismatch if you want to say the the concordant severe PPM is very very few you see that there are very very few people with a meaning that pre predicted and measures are same same with here but this yellow people who have the severe measured PPM but not severe predicted PPM are this these guys here so quite a few for the surgery less so for the tower but still a wide number of patients who have so-called measured PPM but not predicted PPM what are the outcomes so if you look at the outcomes this is the outcomes for SAVR so this is the measured PPM versus predicted PPM predicted PPM is much better in the sense that of course it's very rare so the uh, only 11 patients so this is the this is the challenge if you take this and measure the differences are smaller because some of these patients do better uh, but moderate doesn't doesn't cut it only the severe uh, even measured uh, has a worse outcome and this is now a large number of patients so this is now 170 patients which is about 25 percent of patients this is only two percent of patients if you look at the tower however if you if you take measured or predicted nothing so this is the most amazing part that even for the moderate severe mild whatever way we cut it we don't find a difference in outcomes either this measured or predicted predicted obvious, obviously severe is very rare so you know you will just say moderate or mild and there's no curve the other one uh, so if you look at this this is a interesting part to keep in mind that again when you are reading the literature to understand that how people are saying that this is measured or this is uh, predicted the measured one as another variable that is important to keep in mind that when you measure the LVOT because valve area you have to measure so you have to measure the LVOT and as we know that is circular sometimes not circular when the depending on the valve you place and so you can do a CT measurement or you can measure with the echo and if you do the measurements CT has better discrimination 
uh, compared to the echo in terms of saying that the measured ones with how the, the mortality is predicted. Uh, but again, this is an important thing to keep in mind whether you are going to use the TTE or CT. So I just summarized this. The reason why the reported incidence of PPM varies with tower is that there is echo versus cat, there is an EOA calculation, the timing of measurements immediately or later, correction, obesity or not, and then measurements of calculation differ from all these different reasons. Uh, but this is an important thing to keep in mind. So now there is a very interesting trial. We are also part of it. Uh, this is a trial that is uh, exciting trial because if you have a lower size of the annulus, so which is 430 by this trial, then you would have a self-expanding versus balloon expanding valve or supraannular versus annular valve to see if it makes a difference. So this is a very important part of the trial and I think uh, fairly exciting in my mind uh, to trial to keep an eye on because it's enrolling reasonably fast. Randomized trial. If you have the structural valve deterioration, so this is another very important part to something relatively new to say that what, how they have now defined it, the structural valve deterioration. So if you have biological valve dysfunction, you can define in two parts, that is, is permanent or it is not permanent. And if it is permanent, then you have the structural valve deterioration. If it's not, then obviously it's a, it's a biological valve failure if it's due to thrombosis, endocarditis, things like that. And there are three stages. And these are the VARC-3 criteria. And it is important to recognize that in the VARC-3, there is this more than 10 millimeter gradient or the final gradient more than 20 with decrease in the EOA. So this is an important part so that they are including the, the valve area inside of the VARC definitions. If you go to the European definitions, they, they don't have the valve area. So this is, this is mainly the mean gradient. So these are the two important things, again, to keep in mind that how people are defining, reporting uh, the different types of uh, data because uh, this will be very important to recognize. There is an interesting concept of what we call it a uh, stent creep or whether whatever the reasons are. But even in the patients who do not have, do not have HALT, meaning that there's no valve thrombosis, sometimes the gradient goes up. Uh, and if the gradient goes up, you can dilate those valves and this is the, this is the uh, uh, some multicenter study that Dr. Webb reported to say that if you dilate these valves, their gradients do come down, they do not develop AR, and so early increase in the gradient has been treated with valvuloplasty. So this is something to keep in mind. A few patients do require uh, valve in valve, so it is better to be prepared for valve in valve, but do the valvuloplasty. So this is something that is uh, relatively a new information. Tower in tower, the anatomy is very important. So if you are going to put a self-expanding, self-expanding, what will be the neoskirt and how it will close uh, the coronary access or uh, coronary flow, these are both very important considerations. And whether you put a sapien in sapien or sapien and core valve in each other. So all of those different things can be done. I just wanted to, just for a little mental break, that we have a patient. So this is a patient. Uh, who was in came last year, uh, which we did tower in 2020, 2012, so nine years out. Uh, and we left him with a moderate PVL because at that time that was considered okay. Uh, we would not leave him like that, but the patient didn't have any problems, any problems with left ventricle. He came back because he developed severe mitral stenosis. He had radiation heart disease, and you can see that the mitral gradient is 20. So the mean mitral gradient is 20, the peak is 52. And there is some aortic stenosis, you know, with a gradient of about 30, uh, which is, you know, which is not trivial. So if you look at the distribution of calcium, very calcified aortic valve, mitral valve, and we can again measure the new LVOT, a lot of, you know, is standard way of doing these things. And so we did a valve in valve. And again, as you can see, these days when we do valve in valve for tower, we try to put the top at the same level uh, so that it is not, uh, we can have coronary access. But you can see this, that we left it like this before. So much paravalvular leak here. Uh, and again, the patient did well because the valve was uh, not touching there. So in nowadays, we would not leave it like that. So we did put a uh, large uh, a plug in the PVL closure uh, and the post-PVL closure, the AR was not significant. Uh, much less, 
still there, but much less. Uh, and then we put a mitral valve in MAC, uh, same time, uh, and good result, excellent. And then we discharge the patient the same day. So we could discharge this patient the same day and we could report it uh, in the literature. So again, this is a very useful thing to keep in mind that the percutaneous therapies are becoming at that level. Role of SAVR, as I said that this is a good paper to review uh, because what are, the real re what are the real indications for SAVR? This is the reverse question now people are asking that when do we refer the patient for surgery? And we tried to put a lot of data in this particular paper, but we also tried to put different valves uh, in perspective that where the data exists, where the data doesn't exist for surgical valves, that how long data are available. Because as you, will, as you know, the data for uh, surgical valve durability are variable depending on the valve types. Uh, and uh, this is an important consideration to keep in mind. New technologies, so I think new technologies in the tower world are the accurate NEO, as uh, you know from Boston Scientific, this is a, a very nice valve that can have an access to the coronaries, uh, supraannular, so good hemodynamics, uh, and not much of uh, uh, the risk for pacemaker. It's easy to deploy it high. Uh, pacemaker rate is a little bit higher, but still it is coming down. Uh, and so this is an important, uh, important advance. The Navitor is the new Abbott system to deploy uh, the, the uh, valve again in a more accurate way, uh, Evolute FX, another one, and Yena valve, and then new indications, and then of course we want to improve the outcomes uh, for the patient. So this is the accurate NEO. I'm not going to go in the details, but uh, you know this is a valve that is again uh, a very easy reproducible valve to deploy, uh, and this is a step-by-step -step approach. Yena valve again. This is for the AI or AI plus uh, AS, uh, and commissural alignment is part of this particular valve. I'm sorry, but I don't see the my pictures there it's for some reason. Anyway, it's not very important, but these two systems are available. So now I want to spend maybe 10 minutes or so on the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. So the mitral valve, the most important advancement I think that happened with the mitral clip is the imaging. So the imaging has become so much better so that we are able to do the 3D MPR live and able to see the valve better. Uh, clip, of course, is better to say that uh, you know, we can have independent grasping, larger clips are available, broader clips. So this is also an advancement. But I think the most important is the imaging. So I just want to highlight one patient to say why we think imaging is useful. I'm sorry, but I, my videos, okay, I'll go back again. Uh, sometimes it does that, it may be my computer. Uh, I think it is the right one. So here you can see this, that we are able to now, we are able uh, to show uh, the mitral valve uh, very clearly where we can analyze not just the MR, but also the leaflets. And we can say where the uh, scallops are and how we can pull or push the leaflet so that the valve will not open. This is more important for functional mitral regurgitation than degenerative because degenerative, of course, we know the, the issue with the anatomy. In the functional, it is trickier. Uh, and again, uh, see the posterior leaflet, how nicely we see, we plan that exactly where we are going to put the clip. And then when we are ready to put the clip, as you can see, we can do 3D MPR live. So we can see the needle, uh, as you see here, we can see that in the fossa, how far up it is, how, how much is the height, how posterior you are. Uh, so even though in the past we used to do biplane, this 3D live MPR has changed the way uh, we function. Uh, if you see the clip coming in, uh, we again can see the clip orientation, how straight uh, it is. It is not crooked. The angle of approach is perfect. And then when we are ready to grasp, again, there is no rush. Uh, we can grasp the leaflet. We now decrease our tidal volume. We don't hold the breath or anything like that. Uh, and this helps us tremendously uh, to place the clip exactly where we want to place it. And then we can analyze it. So the imaging has changed, at least 
in my time because from 2005 where we had just biplane no 3d uh, to now where we have this 3d live mpr so we are not even changing any views nothing you just stay there and we analyze it uh, live this is a huge huge difference uh, and then when we analyze the data again we can analyze the data uh, very carefully to say that whether the MR is happening. We look at the ventricular side uh, to sometimes understand because sometimes it sprays from the atrial side. So these are very important things. One, uh, one study that I want to highlight is the Empower. So this is now a different idea that we have this carry on device approved in, uh, in Europe for a long time and we were trying to do the study where we are going to take MR patients and put the carol on and then follow them and then if they need a clip we would put a clip. The, we changed the trial. The trial is now different. So the, what the trial is, is first of all the device is simple. So the reason why we can change the trial I'll come to that. But the device is just 10 French access. You do it in from the, from the uh, IJ. There's no transeptal. There is, there is, you know, if you want to do TE you can but it's not necessary to do the TE. Uh, and conscious sedation is fine uh, and you can so this is a simple device to place uh, may mostly with fluoro so what we did is to change the trial so now the trial is that anybody with a heart failure and dilated cardiomyopathy but the MR does not have to be there so even with a mild 1 plus MR 2 plus MR 3 plus MR 4 plus MR doesn't matter we will stratify the data by the severity of MR, but even the mild, moderate MR we are including. So this is a heart failure trial. So this is to remodel the atrium and the ventricle, because now from the initial trials, we have some data to say that just even without changing the MR, it helps to decrease the LV size, functional status improves. So now the NYHA class two to four, six minute walk distance, you know, somewhat impaired. Uh, and left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50% and diastolic diameter of 60, systolic of less than 70. So, uh, you know, to just to understand that not superly dilated ventricle, but not a normal size ventricle. And they have anti pro BNP of more than 1200 or one admission for heart failure. So, of course, patient has to have heart failure. So, if they have heart failure, cardiomyopathy, whatever amount of MR, we are now going to put this device. And this is a, this is unique because now we are able to enroll the patients with very little MR, so early treatment uh, of functional mitral regurgitation because MR begets MR, so this is the idea. Allows for the alternative therapy in the trial, so you know in three months if they are symptomatic we can put a clip or do another TMVR trial or transplant or whatever they need. Uh, and it's sham controlled, so since it's sham controlled we can use the six minute walk uh, in the part of the trial because it's very simple we need to get IJ access and do a coronary sinus angiogram before we randomize the patient anyhow so after you randomize it is only five ten more minutes to put the device in so it, really speaking you can do this study as a sham because there is no extra procedural steps that you need to do for sham control we just need to not put the device for the tricuspid therapies, uh, I'm not going to go in the tier and all those, but uh, there is a lot of data coming out. There is, uh, the, we have both now, uh, the MitraClip as well as Pascal, both of them have excellent data uh, at the uh, at the PCR, uh, Euro PCR. They also, we also presented the six months data for the Pascal. So a lot of information pointing positive response with tier. Tricuspid valve replacement, we started with the Navigate valve and now we are doing the Evoke. And so we have again incredible uh, safety and efficacy of this device in appropriate patients. However, if you look at this, this strategy, so this is a, again a little change in the, in the thinking, so that if you look at the favorable conditions, people have to have favorable anatomy. And since the patients who are coming to us are at a later stage of the disease process, at least in our experience, 50, 70 percent of the patients, we are not able to enroll in any of the trials because we screen them. We try to say they are candidates for trial limited or not, and then finally they are not. Or if we are able to screen them for evoke, the NLS is too large, sometimes pacemaker related issues. So these are the reasons why we are not able to enroll large number of patients. So then what happens? So 
<coughs> this is an interesting concept. So the trick valve is a bicable valve. So you put one valve in the SVC, one valve in the IVC. They're bovine pericardial valves, fully retrievable. So it's not a high-risk procedure. Uh, there is a minimum RA protrusion from both sides. Uh, so in the future, if you stabilize the patient and if you want to do something more to the patient, you can obviously do it from these valves. So this is not a strategy that eliminates future options. And if you have done the mitral clip or uh, a tricuspid clip and uh, you, have, uh, you don't have adequate result, then this can also be added to those patients. So in both sides, uh, there is a possibility to help the patient. So the idea is to decrease, uh, decrease the uh, filling pressures. Uh, it has to have certain things to happen. So this is the first one we did uh, in United States. So you can see this very simple. So you, this is conscious sedation. So you don't need any TE, nothing. You put a wire in the pulmonary artery and then just deploy the top part. Uh, so you keep the, the, the uh, dilated part of the stent above the pulmonary artery, simple enough. Uh, and in the, in the bottom, you put one catheter in the, uh, in the hepatic vein and then you deploy. And you can do transthoracic echo uh, before you finally release it to make sure that it is not coming out because transthoracic echo is very easy for these patients to see. So this is a simple procedure uh, by which conscious sedation, no guidance. There are data coming out. This is the, uh, the European data uh, of the trick valve. And uh, this particular paper is now accepted in Jack Intervention. So it's going to come out and, and explain uh, that patients are doing well. So their renal function improves, their functional status improves. So we are going to do this trial uh, in United States where we are going to take the patients who are not candidates for tricuspid valve therapies uh, and then randomize them to trick valve versus medical management. And so this particular trial will hopefully start by the end of the year. Uh, so th we are negotiating with, neg not negotiating, we are working with the FDA uh, to come up with the right protocol. So I'll stop there. So we have some time for questions and answers. So the future is outstanding and bright. Uh, and uh, Thank you for your attention, and we can take some questions and have some discussions. So we have some time. Thank you very much, Dr. Kabaria. That was uh, really a tour de force in uh, in the in the latest and the best in the field of transcatheter interventions and structural heart interventions. Uh, I'm going to uh, invite Dr. Faza to uh, to uh, initiate a discussion and ask some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kapadia. That was a phenomenal. Uh, uh, update regarding the latest advances in structural heart disease. Um, a question that we're frequently encountering as we're seeing more and more patients with uh, valve disease, especially elderly patients uh, who are at a high surgical risk, what is your approach to the treatment of patients who have concomitant severe calcific MS and calcific uric stenosis, especially those patients with severe mitral annular calcification are a bit challenging to, to manage? No, very true. Uh, so there are a couple of things. So the first thing is that you're right, that uh, there, are, there are several new things happening in those areas. So the first part is that we have looked at the data from TVT registry, from adverse registry to say that if you have MAC and mitral stenosis, your procedural outcomes of TAVR are no different, meaning that you are able to do TAVR extremely safely. So this is an important part to keep in mind that at least one valve can be treated if you have significant AS. Now, the mitral valve, so obviously if you have mitral stenosis versus you have mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis. So if you do a, a mitral clip, for example, uh, for moderate MAC mm -hmm. and you have a little bit of gradient, then uh, we are doing a study where we are putting, and this is an IDE study with FDA, Grant Reed, one of our young guys and I, we are working together to make this particular study where we are putting a V-wave uh, interatrial shunt mm. in, the, uh, in the interatrium to say that whether we can help with mitral stenosis part of the MAC. Because as you know, the Luttenbacher syndrome, people did well with MS and ASD. So if your right ventricle is okay, then you can potentially do a septostomy kind of approach in this, these patients uh, with mitral. So we have some data to say that uh, when you 
when you have a opening in the septum then your LA pressure gradients obviously are less because you have an opening. The MAC if it is moderate so this is mild MAC where you can put clip if it is moderately severe then tendine is a good option. So the tendine valve has this uh, group of patients that we can treat and then the third option is of course valve in MAC. Valve in MAC is tricky. Uh, it is not easy. Uh, I would say that uh, you have to be extremely careful and very uh, skilled to be able to do valve in MAC uh, because uh, depending on the size, depending on the leaks and things like that and of course the LVOT obstruction, these are challenges. Medical therapy wise, uh, of course when we develop severe MAC that is uh, uh, it's late, but how do we prevent MAC is another thing. So there is a lot of now data coming out about vitamin K2. There was a randomized trial that was negative, but vitamin D3 and K2 are interesting uh, things to keep in mind. Uh, we wrote a little review to say that how the K2 is important in preventing the vascular calcification. So we are planning a randomized study uh, to do with the vitamin D3 and K2. So this is another uh, in my mind uh, an interesting part. So when patients come with moderate MAC, mild MAC, they ask me what can you do to prevent it further mm -hmm. and sometimes I use this. But again, we don't have randomized data to say that this would uh, help or not. But these are considerations. No, that's, those are great points. I, I completely agree with Dr. Faza. These are challenging patients. You know, we've, uh, you know, struggled with these cases and, you know, sometimes we are able to do TMVR if they have, you know, significant MR but those patients with uh, with MAC and stenosis are a challenge. Uh, any experience or any any thoughts, Dr. Kaparia, with lithotripsy? We're using it in the coronary and the peripheral vasculature. Do you? Th uh, what so are again, your thoughts you about know, the yeah, you're right. So the if you look at the balloon results of the uh, of the calcified mitral valve and MAC, they are not very good because depending on how much calcium is on the annulus that is restricting it versus how much it gets into the mitral valve leaflets and the leaflets are getting inside then the leaflets don't move you cannot really break them if you remember from the aortic valvuloplasty times when we did the aortic valvuloplasty we break the calcium as a fracture it heals with more calcium it heals right away like a bone so the long term i personally don't think that this balloon uh, kind of uh, things are likely to work for this uh, purposes, uh, but uh, yeah, after saying that, so sometimes when we do the uh, MAC patients and if you want to put a valve in MAC, I sometimes do a balloon force or with tendine, we do a aggressive balloon valvuloplasty and it's amazing that how many times we see good response uh, to the balloon immediately. Uh, whether that is going to last or not is a question, but sometimes you do see very good response uh, just to the balloon, but it's unpredictable, you know, sometimes it leaks like crazy. So I would not recommend it as a treatment. Right, right, mm -hmm. right, uh, right now. Of course. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Um, I, I appreciate you mentioning the advances in imaging and how it played the role in the uh, tier for the mitral valve. What is your trade-off between MR and MS when you have mild to moderate residual MR, the gradient is borderline? What, what is a prohibitive gradient in, you, in your opinion? And when do you, how do you decide on accepting a little bit more MS or living with a little bit more MR? It's a good question. So again, depends on the patients, obviously. So if you have a young patient who is otherwise active and they want to have active lifestyle, then keeping them with mitral stenosis is worse than having a little bit of mitral regurgitation because as you remember, as you know, mitral regurgitation people tolerate it much better uh, than mitral stenosis if you're going to increase the heart rate. On the other hand, if you have patients who are not that you are old or with functional mitral regurgitation, uh, then it's a, you know, and many times they have a pacemaker, you can, you can target the heart rate easily without a lot of medications. So those are the patients that I have no problem having a little bit more of a gradient. Uh, I think mean gradient of maximum of six, seven is what I, I live with, uh, with a heart rate of <coughs> maybe 65, 70. Uh, but uh, 
after saying that sometimes we do have higher gradients sometimes people have placed the clips a little bit distally so to say with less leaflet inside so that it doesn't cinch it as much smaller clips smaller size clips or don't tighten it all the way these are all uh, not standard approaches but these are all possible if you have uh, patience to kind of uh, and of course now by the end of the year we may have Pascal approved so this is another very useful device that you will see for this particular reason to decrease the mitral stenosis because, because it has a spacer. Mm -hmm. So uh, it appears that way that by the end of the year we should have a commercial right. Right. Uh, approval. So okay. question about TAVR, you know, we are really interested in <coughs> this patient prosthesis mismatch, hemodynamics, structural valve deterioration. As you know, you know, we, uh, use a, we, we use both kinds of valves. We use a lot of self-expandable valves, uh, you know, uh, partly because of the hemodynamic uh, uh, Benefit, uh, yeah. benefits. Um, <coughs> what do you think is the main reason in the, some of the data which you shared, which are, again, very interesting, between SAVR and TAVR, the, the impact of patient prosthesis mismatch not, uh, you know, resulting in uh, poor outcome in TAVR versus SAVR? So there are two parts. So patient populations are different sometimes. Of course, these were partners' patients, so they were comparable. <coughs> But I think these are high risk patients. They don't have a very, uh, you know, their mortality and their outcomes are worse in general. So it drowns the effect of right. patient prosthesis mismatch. Survivor bias. Survivor bias because you are already used, you know, you are sick. So that's one part. So if you are going to take very young people, low risk patients, it may make more of an impact. However, after saying that, if you look at even surgical data, where the papers from even Cleveland Clinic, where if you look at just the gradients, it's hard to find a difference in the outcome long term just with the gradients. So the patient prosthesis mismatch is important in surgical literature, but is all, all predicted. So if you really put a small valve, then it's a problem. So I think that. There is, it is, there is no question, right? We are treating aortic stenosis, so if we are going to leave them with stenosis, it's no good. So we have to have good hemodynamics. So this is no question. Mm -hmm. The what is good and what is not so good and how you measure good versus bad. This is why I presented this data to say that you have to be a little bit more careful when you analyze this information. And I think this SMART trial is a great trial. And the, as you know, there are several new technologies that are coming to say that when you put a valve in valve uh, or initial valve that they will have a better EOA. So this is, this is in, in works with several different companies, several different uh, things. So uh, the question is that how do you treat a valve failure, right? If you have a tower valve failure and if you have to send them to surgery, it's so terrible. And some people are doing minimal invasive surgery where just remove the leaflet, not the valve and put a surgical valve inside uh, of the valve. So that's a one way to treat right. self-expanding <coughs> valves. Or one of our patients had this problem where we put the valve in the leaflet. So we would do basilica-like thing where we perforate the leaflet and then we would put the valve inside of the leaflet so that we don't have to do. Because if the valve is not oriented right, then even basilica, does not help uh, right. because if you're a commissioner in front of it, right. uh, then it is a challenge. So all of those things are are important things to keep in mind. Do you think there is a uh, there may be a potential role with the type of antithrombotic therapy and structural valve deterioration, meaning antiplatelet, dual antiplatelet, anticoagulation? I mean, we've moved away just like you showed. You know, we use single antiplatelet in all patients. We use dual antiplatelet if they've had a recent PCI. We use anticoagulation if they have AFib. But do you think that may have any impact? Are there any data to suggest that? I think there's data, as you know, because <coughs> even in the Atlantis and Galileo trial, both of them, you know, if you take out the harm, you know, if you say that they didn't, you know, if everybody didn't have any harm, then they did better in terms of the gradients and in terms of fault. So uh, if you select the right patient population, you might have a benefit with anticoagulation. But also, I think this is where. I'm also interested in knowing that 
so one one paper we we recently wrote of course not in prosthetic valves but in the moderate as patients we looked at the patients who had calcium supplements versus no calcium mm -hmm. supplements and there was a mortality difference everything was bad with calcium supplements uh, so the question is that if we give vitamin k2 vitamin d3 less calcium would we be able to keep the valve longer and i have some theories myself to think that the if the valve touches the aortic wall in the areas where the commissural posts are then sometimes the fibrous tissue grows in that area and this is why i think the balloon works so the balloon valvuloplasty in the early failure worked without they didn't have any halt or anything so why is it working what what is it doing so it is i think the commissural part that is pinched and that may be the reason i think we have a couple of questions dr faza yes, uh, we have a question from dr stephen little uh, thank you for a masterful presentation with this revolution in uh, structural heart disease medicine how will interventional cardiologists imagers surgeons be trained for these clinical and procedural skills what is your training approach at cleveland clinic well, very important so i think that the the structural intervention uh, has to be, you know, people have to be trained extra. So just one year of training is not enough for the interventional cardiology and same one year of training for imager is not enough. So you need to have two years of training for both of them because you need to have general training so that you can handle all the complications and basic understanding of hemodynamics, both imaging wise and, and intervention wise. But then you need to learn the nuances of each of this in the extra year. So I think we have two years training for both of them. Uh, and uh, there is no, I don't think there is a shortcut because this is <coughs> the most important part of your training for the people who are training, which they are going to use. So why cut there? You know, if you had to cut somewhere, you can, you know, skip a rotation of obstetrics and things like that in your, uh, you know, medical school or something. But, you know, there is no reason uh, to skip this, this important part. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. This is, this is critical. Um, I think there is one more question, uh, Nadine. Yes, uh, another question from the audience. <coughs> from the imaging <coughs> perspective, what about the limitations of a patient prosthesis mismatch diagnosis using the ordinary TE and how can we overcome and obtain an accurate assessment? So again, the accurate, there is, there is nothing wrong with the measurements. So the measurements are accurate. The idea is that when do you suspect? So if the aortic size is small, uh, then you should suspect that there is a, there is a pressure recovery element mm -hmm. of this coming. And then you can utilize the equation that I kind of equation I, I highlighted to say that you can try to see that what would be in the worst situation, the, uh, the pressure recovery so that you can cut back that much. So this is the reason why I put that little equation simple enough mm -hmm. uh, to measure. Wonderful. I think uh, we are at uh, 901. I would like to, we would both like to thank you, Dr. Kaparia, for, right, for coming you. all the way to Houston in person and, uh, and giving us your insights uh, and this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much uh, for joining us and for those who have not been able to join in person, uh, this talk will be uh, on the DeBakey Education channel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank it was you. great.